because any marketer, we've all kind of looked at each other like that Spider-Man meme where we're all pointing at each other. Sort of a do we, don't we, maybe, you, me, my team, your team. <laughs> um, that's sort of how I felt like TikTok was, you know, a year or so ago. And even still, there's a lot of questions, you know, around its privacy and, and some of its growth trajectory. And, um, and so we're fielding those constantly as marketers um, about which channels we should and should not be on. And again, customers, North Star, if they're on it and they're engaging and there's meaningful things to be learned and new products to be innovating and surprise and delight moments we could be capitalizing on, you know, who are we to not be visible and not be present and not be offering and gifting brand love and learning. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword laden schmaltz, real world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. We can say that. Sure, we can say that. Ugh, I don't like having to utter this phrase in meetings because it's not what you can say. It's what you should say, right? I've heard so many times, hey, we can say that in an ad or we could write a press release about that. Oh, the hubris in that statement. Should you? Because we get lulled into this false confidence in the four walls of our offices when we think we can make use of our budget and put whatever we want into ads or press releases or on websites. Sure, I guess technically you can. You can write those words down. It's not illegal. No one will stop you. Media companies, they'll gladly take your money for that placement. But should you? Because the ultimate decider is the customer. So no matter what you pay to say, no matter what you can say, the customer will decide whether you should say it. Which is why I love this lesson from a podcast guest application. Never underestimate the power of your customer. It doesn't matter if you have a fancy title or a massive media budget. The customer has far more power than you. I love it. Here to share the story behind that lesson, along with many more lesson-filled stories, is Erica Lovegreen, the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications at ICUC. Thanks for being here, Erica. Daniel, thank you so much. I'm a huge fan of the show, and so it is a it is a dream to get the chance to talk to you, and hopefully I can share some fun stories, um, have a little self-deprecation too, but um, really appreciate you having me on. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And you've got some interesting stories to tell. But first, let me let people understand who I'm talking here. Let's dip into your background a bit. Just cherry picking a few things. Uh, Erica has been a TV news producer for NBC affiliate WSLS TV owned by Media General. She's been an advertising account executive for Berkshire Hathaway Media, a director of corporate communications and branding at Medical Facilities of America. And for the past six years, she's been at ICUC, where she is senior vice president of marketing and communications. Communications. ICUC is a Dentsu agency with a team of 450. Dentsu, I'm sure you've heard of them, but uh, they're a public company that reported, I love this, 1.117 trillion yen in annual revenue in 2022. That's about $8.59 billion. Uh, Erica herself managed a team of 30 when she oversaw the strategy team helping clients. But right now, she is doing marketing for ICUC itself, where she manages a team of six, along with a variety of partners and contractors. So Erica, give us a sense. What is your day like as the SVP of Marketing and Communications? Yeah, who, Daniel, that was a mouthful on my background. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of twists and turns there. But my day-to-day -day truly is ICUC is my client. We are trying to attract, um, you know, really large enterprise brands to come and want to partner with us. Um, if you're unfamiliar with ICUC, we're kind of a unique agency. We help enterprise brands specifically with their online community management and customer care. We're a 24-7 agency, which is super unique. And, you know, being a marketer for a 24-7 agency globally has its own unique challenges. Um, but, you know, a day for a day in a life for me is um, brainstorming new campaigns to try to target in enterprise leaders to want to work with us. Um, you know, I think another big part of my day is team mentorship. I absolutely love working with different marketers who are wearing the different hats on my team, whether it's from CRM management and making sure our data is really good to, again, add in campaign planning to content planning. Um, so we do a lot of strategic workshops. 
in my role, I actually also oversee product. So we're kind of innovating the next services for the agency and figuring out how to bring those to market. Um, and again, being a global agency, you know, we're really trying to think big. We're really trying to think about, you know, unique value propositions and um, different markets across Europe, um, looking at Asia Pacific, for example. So um, every day is a bit of a new day. I also sit as a member of the executive leadership team of the agency. So um, while I absolutely have a massive passion for the marketing piece of it, I'm also thinking about the 450 employees and sort of the strategic direction of the actual organization itself, along with my peers that do that work, um, to really think through how we continue to scale and grow and be a healthy organization with a great culture. Um, so, you know, again, I get, I get to wear a lot of different hats, um, which brings me a lot of joy. Um, and again, I, I really love marketing for a unique, you know, unique organization. Well, perfect. Well, I'm sure there's a lot we're going to be able to learn from your current role and also your previous roles. Yeah. So let's take a look first at some lessons from the things you made. That's what we get to do as marketers. It's kind of unique. I've never done anything else. I've never been a, you know, actuary or podiatrist or I don't know. But I don't feel like people get to make things like we do in other industries. So uh, here's your first lesson. You say, be comfortable stepping into new in industries to gain the necessary experience. And I guess you didn't even start in this industry, right? No, I, I did not start as a marketer. Um, I aspired to be a journalist. I went to school as a, to learn to be a journalist. I, inter I did internships. I, um, my first job was at a TV station. And that's really where I wanted to go. I had visions of grandeur, you know, today's show producer, or if you've watched, you know, on HBO, the show, the morning, not HBO, Apple TV, the morning show. I mean, I wanted to live that life. Um, I worked overnight shifts, all, all the many things. Um, what I love about television is you have to ask really great questions. <laughs> Storytelling is your North star. You absolutely need to understand your audience. And at some point along the way, after working overnights for many, many years, I think I had an aha moment that maybe I could really apply that in different, in, in different industries or different capacity. Um, I knew I was going to be staying local. When you work in television, you become very transient. I was getting married and wanting to, you know, have children and, and kind of move into that season of my life. Um, and so I kind of went into a, a bit of a reinvention. Um, and I found myself um, having, you know, a little bit of an opportunity in a sales capacity. And then from there, um, there was a local corporation that was a senior living corporation. Um, but they were looking for a pretty entry level marketer and communication manager to come in and learn and help grow and take some of the skills that I had from being a journalist. And I had to tell a convincing story of why a, a random, you know, journalist, aspiring journalist wanted to become a marketer and how I could maybe help them. But what was really fun and beautiful about kind of getting into a different industry and being willing to say yes to something that wasn't maybe outwardly as exciting as other industries um, was that I really got to cut my teeth. I got to learn and they were willing to let me learn and give me resources to grow. And I had great mentors in and around me. Um, I got to work with agencies and kind of hear from them and see how they were building strategies. I got to um, be a part of a team that was doing incredible work. And it was very, it had its B2B elements and then it had its direct to consumer elements too. Um, and so I got to kind of learn all the different things that, you know, I needed to be to be successful at that time. Um, so all that to say, I think in the learning lesson, saying yes, and stepping outside of a comfort zone and not making past judgments on a specific industry or a specific business for what they do. There are very passionate people behind those brands and very passionate people in those industries. And um, it lent me, you know, an opportunity through networking to find myself at ICUC, which is an agency. And at an agency, we get to work across, we're not, we're, we work across industries. So I went from that to getting to work with almost every single industry, but I learned not to pass judgment and find why we get excited about the randomness that maybe one industry or one business might be doing. Um, and I'm just very thankful. Again, it an interesting background, but I loved getting to bring that sort of, you know, no judgment, judgment-free zone <laughs> thinking 
um, you know, into, into that work. And, um, so yeah, again, a learning lesson I feel very passionately about, and I try to gift onto those who, you know, maybe taking a bit of an atypical route to get where they are, um, where they are today. So you mentioned you had an Olivia Pope moment when you went from being in journalism to being uh, at this, I think a senior living company you worked at. And I just want to ask, you know, as a journalist, like what did you bring to that role in like PR or marketing about actually serving the customer with your messaging that really helped you? Because that's one thing as marketers, I think, or PR people, sometimes it, it, you don't have that journalist background. Your focus is more on, okay, I know I'm trying to convert or sell them on something, right? Where journalists, they, they come from it from like, yes, they got to get a conversion. You got to get clicks on the headline or people to watch the story on the news. They're great with, you know, the the little uh, conversion they try to do before the commercial, of like, you know, stay tuned to see, you know, what restaurant in town has like, you know, you know cockroaches everywhere, whatever. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they're, they're serving with their messaging, not just trying to sell. So I wonder for you as a journalist, you know, take us maybe into your Olivia Pope moment. How did that background help in a moment where you're surrounded more by business people and marketers and PR people, but you had those journalist chops? Yeah, I think some of the things that, you know, I really brought to that that table, we're not burying the lead. I mean, it's so funny because we get, when you've been in a brand for a really, really long time, and honestly, even been in an agency for a long time, or just been in any business for a long time, you just get kind of stuck in your way of thinking. So you write something that you think is absolutely beautiful and compelling. And you really realize, you know, when you have, I think, an objective or secondary eye at it, or a journalistic lens to it, you know, oftentimes the the key thing you're trying to say might be actually buried very, very deeply at the bottom. So my, you know, some of my Olivia Pope moments were standing there with senior executives that were, mu- you know, much older than me, much more experienced than me, come from very deep medical backgrounds too. So brilliant people, um, you know, and here I was this kind of millennial came in, you know, I was the social media gal, <laughs> Um, you know, my, my CEO, who I think very, very highly of would kind of joke with me and say, go tweet that Erica, you know, but they, they loved that I could kind of bring sort of this, um, Hey, I think maybe we're like, this thing is the actual interesting thing in the whole thing that you just said. I think this is actually the really interesting thing. And in journalism too, we're really taught, especially as a news producer, you have to think if you're writing a script you're not talking to, you know, the most highly educated person within your demographic, you have to talk, you know, you have to say something compelling to them, but equally as compelling to someone who might have a fourth grade education. So you have to, you kind of have to cut through the jargon, cut through the noise, what are you trying to say? Um, And again, it was the skill set that in the medical industry, especially, is very, very valuable to take these extremely complex topics and sort of distill them down for a lay person and your everyday person. And it relates to the customer because the customer most of the time is just your everyday person. So got to get away from corporate speak and company speak and medical speak, um, things like the word ambulatory. What is that? (laughs) You know, our physical therapy guy, adore him. He, you know, would say things like that. And I'm like, I'm sorry, walking? Like, are we talking about <laughs> um, so, you know, again, we had to, I think I brought again, that interesting sort of lens and I, I pride myself as a marketer today to still keep that lens. And again, try to ask, you know, a good line of questioning to make sure that we're really getting to the heart, you know, the heart of what we're trying to do and what our goal is and what we're trying to serve. You know, that's a great point. I've heard, you know, TV news is, I don't know, sixth grade level, eighth grade level or whatever it's written for. And sometimes since we're trying to sell as marketers, we're trying to sound so big and fancy. I mean, it's bad in tech. Like it's bad in healthcare. I remember working with a, some healthcare client they're using like nephrology or something like that. We're talking about kidneys and I'm like, no, they, they, people don't understand that. I mean, you sound smart now. Okay, now I trust you. But like, nobody's gonna know what you're talking about. So that's another great approach. That's another great thought of like, okay, making sure you're speaking at their language as opposed to trying to impress them, right? Um, yes. But another group where you have to serve them and speak their language uh, is your own employees. And you said, hey, here's another lesson. If leading a team, value being patient and hiring the right people. So how did you take that approach when you built your team, I think, of 30? Yeah. So when I started out leading the strategy team over here at ICUC, we had like four of us. Um, We were kind of the OG group. And this was a 
product line that we were looking to scale and grow to go from four to about 30 um, is very, very ambitious. Sales was, is very, very busy. Um, But I think, you know, some of the lesson that I learned when you're hiring a really, really large team or, you know, again, agency brand doesn't matter. I think you're under pressure when you need to hire, (laughs) you feel this sense of kind of getting, getting the right people, but we got to do it quickly because we have work that's actively happening or a scope that we need to actively fulfill. Um, But the lesson that I've learned is that anytime you rush, you're probably going to miss, you know, miss the mark on asking the right questions, properly vetting, um, properly making sure to a job needs to be mutual. It needs to be a mutual fit. You want that individual to really, as much as you're selling them, they're selling you. This needs to be a process where you really get to know each other um, and get to know the different, the type of work that they're going to be doing. Um, and I think it's it's okay to just sort of slow down and, and take your time. Um, I had an incredible boss actually at the healthcare corporation. This is a, you know, another big anecdote and, you know, we can, we can take that how far we want to go, but um, I was eight months pregnant when they hired me and the, the hiring manager at the time who ended up being my boss made a comment to me that, you know, look, we're looking for the right person. And if that means that we need to wait through maternity leave, you know, it'll be worth it to us. And it's going to be painful because boy, we want you to start like yesterday. Um, But you know, you have the chops, you have what we're looking for. And you know what, we're gonna, we've made it this far, let's make it a little bit further. So, um, you know, I, I think I adopted that sort of way of thinking of, you know, how can we make a, we don't want to draw out an interview process, we definitely don't want to waste candidates time. Um, But I think really making sure that we're considering the goals, considering the needs of the clients, considering what our scope may or may not be. um, And, you know, personality and all of the many, many, many things that kind of go into that candidate experience Um, on both sides of that fence. We want to, you know, my lesson is to definitely um, it's okay to slow down. It's okay to make sure that, you know, that it's the right fit. And if that individual, you know, can't wait or, you know, what, for whatever reason, um, you know, then, then maybe it wasn't meant to be in the first place. Well, let's talk about something as a team leader. I'm not sure if we need to be more or less patient at this point <laughs> in the world, uh, what about AI? What about artificial intelligence? Because you talk about a team leader, talk about hiring people. I, boy, I've been where you are. We've got a lot of work going on. We need to bring in a lot of people. But now it seems like AI is almost part of the conversation. Like, is that part of your headcount? Is that part of your team? Like, how does that factor in? And like, for example, you know, we get pitched all the time at Marketing Sherpa, cover this company, cover that company. And I got pitched by this new podcast AI company. And, uh, you know, they didn't have a case study like we normally publish, but I had an idea of like, hey, why don't you just do some, we've got a podcast, just do some of the stuff for our podcast. We'll just publish it. We'll show people. And it'll be like a demo of your product without people having to do a sales call. So it'll serve them. They could just see what it does. And it got me thinking like, wow, this is kind of just part of your team. You'd, You'd hire a person to do all or part of this before. So as a team leader, as you're thinking of hiring, as you're thinking of staffing up, you know, how patient should we be with artificial intelligence? And, and what role does that play on our teams? Do you have any experience with that? Ooh, yeah, artificial, <laughs> artificial intelligence is certainly a hot topic, you know, living in, in and around the agency landscape. I think we talk about it at nauseum, you know, not only at my agency, creative agencies are talking about it, you know, kind of where can we sort of cut corners and, and, um, and leverage it. And, you know, I think my fundamental core belief is that I think there is a place for it. I think, um, how do we bring humans and the tech together? Oftentimes, the humans have to train the technology. So there's still thought that's going to have to go into it. And then it has to be audited. I think my concern with AI is not even the AI. I think that it's very easy for, unfortunately, marketers or busy people to set it and forget it. And that happens oftentimes when we're running paid campaigns, you know, Google and all the social channels, they all have AI functionality and it's easy to dump a ton of money into, you know, whatever platform. And I think if you get lazy and you set it and you forget it, then the AI is going to take over and it's going to start making mistakes. And, you know, it, it claims that it starts finding efficiencies, but while it's building out some of those efficiencies, it could also be breaking other things. And I just, again, I think we have to be really, really careful. It can help, and but we have to continuously be training it. We have to continuously be kind of keeping an eye on it. And then from a content marketing perspective, it's super controversial, and I, I know that. Um, 
it's going to miss the anecdotes. It's, well, you know, if we want to go back to my journalistic viewpoint on things, you know, it's going to miss the anecdotes of the storytelling. So it can spit out a lot of good verbiage and jargon and kind of hit the SEO highlights and hit, you know, maybe the things that you're looking for it to do, but it's not going to say, I personally experienced this thing. The I statements really don't exist in there. And the I statements are the most compelling normally. And they're the ones that really take us, I think, into that, into that journey and that experience. So if you want to find some efficiencies in your content, sure, no problem. Um, you know, crafting a calendar invite or crafting something that's not going to have an I statement. But if you need an I statement, um, I think it's a cautionary tale if you're not, you know, really involving yourself a little bit more in that writing process. Um, so that's my my take on it, you know, for better or for worse, but um, passionate about it. Again, I'm not a, not a naysayer. There are people who are like, none of it. Um, I think I'm a meat in the middle kind of person, but we need to proceed with caution. Well, and to use an example from your journalist background, good journalist finds the human interest in the story, right? So as you said, it's not just reporting the facts. I mean, the facts, that's pretty much a commodity, but getting that human interest, that works in journalism, that works in marketing too. That's what it's all about. And so this is why I love your next lesson is never underestimate the power of your customer. So I think whether it's AI, whether it's hiring the right team, whether it's getting in the right industry, it all comes down to why do we do that? We do that to serve a customer. So give us a sense. How did you learn this lesson? Never underestimate the power of your customer. Um, well, when you work with enterprise brands at scale, it is so incredible that one teeny tiny comment buried very deeply within a social page can be the one thing that sets off a virtual viral firestorm. Um, you know, I have, of course, we'll be, you know, kind of careful about the brands and the who, what, when, and where, but, um, I mean, truly in my experience and what I have seen one teeny tiny comment can make it or break it. It can spark the biggest, we know it go on TikTok, you know, go on, go into Instagram. It can spark the biggest new trend that everyone gets really, really excited about or it can be really the demise and the moment that a brand, you know, gets called out for something and you have a little bit of that group think mentality and all of a sudden you're on the front, you know, the brand's on the front page news for, you know, for a viral moment. Um, and so I, I think that um, if you don't have good social listening sort of set up and kind of paying attention, if you don't have, if you're not kind of in the detailed weeds, again, it kind of goes along that theme of, getting a little bit lazy, you know, if we're not kind of in the details, the devil of the details, um, and really appreciating each and every interaction we have, um, you know, you could, you could really be the next brand that, you know, has a problem for yourself and, and have market share go down very, very quickly. Also just the spread of misinformation can happen really, really quickly. Um, you know, and that can hurt a brand if you're not kind of staying on it. Um, so yeah, I, I feel pretty passionately um, from watching, you know, some of the enterprise brands in and out and around who um, have went viral or not, you know, for good reasons or for bad reasons, just based off of one singular comment. So yeah, so I agree with you about going viral. Um, but you also talk about the customer as a North Star. So I wonder, like, if you have any example, and you don't have to name a brand if you don't want, but of being, you know, proactive and seeing kind of what the general trends, what's going on with the customer, and yeah, just, you know, a viral comment, but the general trends, okay, we're learning something about a customer here, the, our customers in general, right? And based on that, here's some change we need to do to serve them better. Uh, like, for example, and this, this is the most stark example, you know, I can think of. Uh, I did a case study with Montefiore Health System, right? And their customers or employees were the North Star. And then, you know, wow, COVID-19, <laughs> right? That came up. And so then, you know, the case was about how they shifted their social media and their content and their websites and all of these things to serve their customer differently. You know, they had to give more information and tell them what they could do, what they couldn't do, how they could visit, how they could use healthcare, um, but also serve their employees differently because they needed to appreciate their employees <laughs> in a whole new way and in a whole new level and make sure they were heard and make sure the community felt, you know, that the employees felt all the community being after them. Um, and so I wonder for you, you know, Erica, it's great, you know, looking at that one viral moment or that one comment, but we also want this broader understanding from our social media and our content of what is going on with our customers? How are they yeah. shifting? How are the sands shifting? Do you have any examples of how you've been able to like kind of discover that and pivot based on yeah. that? I can definitely speak to that. You know, one one that comes to mind really, I think is was the emergence of TikTok. 
And, you know, a lot of our brand partners, you know, it was sort of a, do we, don't we, don't we, what is this? And one of the brands that we partner with that I am so awestruck by um, is Chili's. Um, Chili's is, you know, they were kind of one of the first ones that were like, our audience they're like giving us a lot of feedback here and they're interested and they're talking and how can, you know, do we jump in? Do we not jump in? So ultimately they did. And they, you know, did a lot of surprise and delight of some of their swag and pajamas, I I believe it was, and, you know, kind of gifting, you know, some of their consumers, some product um, as a thank you for following their page and, you know, and giving kind of their good customer service moments. Um, And, you know, I just think that the, you know, it's important as a marketer to really be paying attention where your audience is and what makes them tick and where they're going. And um, I think TikTok was one of those ones that it's not a channel for everyone. That's another kind of learning lesson in all of that. If you know your audience really well, you can kind of say like, this isn't really for us. This really is. But TikTok caught the marketing world by storm and, you know, it grew so, so quickly. And we're, it's an evolved strategy of things that we were doing on other traditional channels. And, um, you know, I, again, I commend, you know, I commend Chili's as a brand for being one of the earlier adopters. There are many other examples of early adopters, but being an early adopter is hard. You have to, we have been thrown a lot of new platforms, a lot of new channels, a lot of new offerings and subscriptions and things we should and shouldn't be doing as marketers and picking the one that you really look at and you're like, Hmm, our, our audience fits this and it's engaging and it's fun and it's different. And we want to invest our, our dollars and our time here. You know, you have to have to navigate that. And, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of convincing of internal stakeholders and all the, you know, all the things that exist there. So, um, that probably be one that, you know, is really close close to a lot of us because any marketer, we've all kind of looked at each other like that Spider-Man meme where we're all pointing at each other, sort of a do we, don't we, maybe you, me, my team, your team. (laughs) Um, That's sort of how I felt like TikTok was, you know, a year or so ago. And even still, there's a lot of questions, you know, around its privacy and and some of its growth trajectory. And and so we're fielding those constantly as marketers um, about which channels we should and should not be on. And again, customers, North Star, if they're on it and they're engaging and there's meaningful things to be learned and new products to be innovating and surprise and delight moments we could be capitalizing on, you know, who are we to not be visible and not be present and not be offering and gifting brand love and learning. And um, so, you know, again, I customer North Star, and you'll know what you need to do as a brand, um, I think, to be successful. Yeah, well, I'll tell you one thing I like about TikTok. I don't generally uh, like or use it personally. So actually the AI Guild this week, uh, I opened it up with some TikTok videos and someone was coming to me like, Daniel, like watch this TikTok. And I'm like, no, not as a civilian. <laughs> like not in my personal life, I'm not using TikTok. Like my kids have shown it to me. But boy, as a marketer, the thing that's so powerful is, you know, when I started in this industry, I started doing print ads, like in the Wall Street Journal and stuff. And and it was really hard to get that type of customer wisdom and insight and feedback, you know, and like you had to be like a really big brand to do these studies. I don't know if people remember, like it used to walk through the mall and someone would stop you in the mall (laughs) and try to pay you to be part of a focus group just because they're trying to get what you're thinking. But now, like that certain age group that uses TikTok a lot, they're, it's a focus group. They're just sharing it all on TikTok. You can see it all. And so what I was presenting about in the AI Guild was about drive throughs now, fast food restaurants using AI. And so we could just see, we could pull it up. Like this would, this would be a big consumer study you'd have to do, right? Well, we, we could pull it up on TikTok. Here's people that like it and you see them liking it, right? Here's people that have issues with it and you see them having issues with it. It's so powerful. It, you know, I... I, one of my fundamental core beliefs, the more time I spend on TikTok, but something, you know, I, I heard at some point, I listened to a lot of podcasts, so I, someone probably touched on it. Um, if you like Google, you actually probably like TikTok because it it can function in part as a search engine. If you have a curiosity that you would go to Google and you would type in, you know, your ailment or your question or your need, you can go to TikTok and type in that same thing, that syndrome, that thing, that quirk, that, again, curiosity. And TikTok will deliver a visual version of, you know, in video form of what you would probably get in your Google responses because a lot of healthcare companies are innovating searchable content. 
real everyday people are kind of posting about their thing that maybe they thought was unique, but maybe it's not as unique as you thought it was. Once you see there's an audience of people sharing their anecdotes and their experiences. And so again, if you know, TikTok has a lot of different kind of types and use cases, you know, across the spectrum, but boy, Google is powerful in our world and, you know, in intent and search and all the many things. If, if an individual likes Google, more than likely, you know, there might be a case to be made for having a TikTok strategy. Um, and their audience has shifted. I think we had certainly that perception when it first kind of came out of all our Gen Zers and, you know, kind of our, our young folks using it. And they were, and they are creating a lot of quirky, fun videos. But the evolution of that, I think, is super fascinating to kind of study and keep an eye on because that age, at that age, has trended up and started to, you know, shift a little bit. And you're getting a lot of, folks, you know, millennials, and even beyond that interested, because they're searching, they want to learn things. And again, their curiosities are a quick, you know, um, type in the search bar away for them to, you know, learn from other people. And again, and maybe a little more visually compelling than what you would get um, in a little more human element than you might get in a typical search engine. And, you know, that's a great opportunity for brands in a lot of fields where the reliability and credibility of the of the information is important, because obviously, there's a lot of things trending on TikTok. Some of it's accurate, some of it's not depending where it's coming from. And I, you know, here in Jacksonville, we got the Mayo Clinic right here. And one thing I saw is content marketing started Boy, the Mayo Clinic, they were so good at content marketing online. And so whatever the thing was, they had the good content. Like I said, Google, Mayo Clinic would have it there. And so I don't follow TikTok closely enough to know who those brands are, but it seems to me like that is a big opportunity for definitely the healthcare field, probably finance, technology, some other fields to have a credible voice and say, hey, this thing is trending or this thing's being talked about. Here are some facts from a credible voice and to kind of build their brand that way. Yeah, it's, it's again, I think really fascinating um, as marketers to sit down on that. And again, in the spirit of the customer, you have to really know your audience and you have to know your value proposition and you need to know um, what it is you're trying to offer from your marketing team. Um, Mayo Clinic is a great example. I mean, they're an educational authority and they pride themselves on being, you know, a massive warehouse of data and information and educational um, articles for people to go and understand what might be going on with them. Um, and if you want to be in all the places that people might be trying to um, trying to understand what might be going on with their health journey, you know, again, you would you would want to be in places that individuals could search and find community and find understanding. And and again, you want it to be factual. And it what gets scary is when people are creating content and it's not coming from an authoritative place. So it's really refreshing when brands do get behind creating some of that educational content in searchable places like a TikTok or, you know, even Instagram in its own right, um, because maybe it's coming with a little bit more fact and a little bit more, um, you know, good, good data to be, you know, engaging with and reading and understanding than, um, you know, letting just your everyday person maybe give their point of view. So I think we all have to, you know, that's a whole other can of worms, but I think we all need to be mindful of, you know, who's posting what's being posted as we're digesting all that content. Absolutely. Well, in the first half of the show, we talked about lessons from the things Erica made. In the second half, we're going to talk about lessons from the people she made it with. That's a great thing we get to do with marketers. We get to make things. We get to make it with people. Uh, but first, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs Institute, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. MechLabs AI can write your headlines, value prop, competitive analysis, and more based on the results of 10,000 marketing experiments. It's totally free and you don't even have to register for now. So just go to mechlabsai.com, begin trying it out. M-E-C-L-A-B-S-A-I.com to get artificial intelligence working for you. All right, with that, uh, let's take a look at this first lesson from someone you collaborated with. You said you need to quickly serve the customer to create a great experience. And you learned this from Jay Bear, who you call an author, speaker, friend, and tequila enthusiast. So tell us how you learned this from Jay. Yeah, so Jay and I go back um, a little ways. We've done some collaborations through my current agency, ICUC. Um, I also was a co-host of the Social Pros podcast, which he helped found. Um, so we've known each other a while. And, you know, what I love, he puts out a ton of thought leadership. He's written several books. Um, and he really, really cares about the customer journey, like to the point that this man would write a whole book and do research studies on this topic. And so um, I think I just have a deep, profound respect 
for him um, that, you know, again, to make a whole career out of customer care, um, I think takes a really, really special person. And so I really, um, you know, he kind of does a little bit of the, my homework for me, <laughs> and I appreciate getting to take that in. Um, and he is absolutely a tequila enthusiast, too. So if you um, like that, uh, he definitely has some good recommendations. But I, I appreciate, you know, what he has to say in our industry. And I think he's certainly someone worth worth looking up if if customer care in your marketing strategy is something that you that you value. Um, and his some of his most recent research really goes to speed. And you know, that you can't just keep people waiting. And I think that's logical for us all to say, like, there's a lot of logic in it. But when you're actually practicing that as a marketer, and you're looking at your resources and where you throw your resources behind, it's not as easy to execute that as you think, <laughs> um, especially at scale, at volume, you're, you're prioritizing. Um, and so, you know, my fundamental belief is, you know, I think you just have to, again, really know your audience. I think you need to think channel by channel. Your strategy cannot be the same across the board. Um, and you need to really gut check where you need that speed and where maybe you can gift yourself a little bit of grace. Um, but it's tough. It's tough out there when volumes are high to kind of pick and choose, you know, who you're going to get to the fastest. Yeah, I, I love some Jay Bear. I love me some Jay Bear. And we were, we were talking, I first met him like 15 years ago. And we had him come speak at Marketing Sherpa event. And we've had him speak at several Marketing Sherpa events. And I remember, you know, he was an agency guy. And, and I remember we were like having a beer after speaking once. And he was just kind of saying like, like, here's how I'm going to do it. Like, you know, because he wanted to do that thing of become an author, become a speaker, become that kind of thought leader thing, you know. And it was just really cool to see back then, you know, and back then, I don't know, he's a nice, likable guy, he was a good speaker, good writer, like hopefully, but you know, you don't know if it's going to pan out. And it's just nice. It was nice to see like that thought and strategy that he put into, okay, like, here's how I'm going to do it. He's just kind of like laying it out for me. Um, versus, you know, some people who try to take that tactic, like, I'll just hire some speaker bureau, whatever, they'll figure it out. Or, you know, my uh, book publicist or whatever, they'll figure it out. We'll just buy our way into the New York times. Um, so anyway, so one great lesson from that, just from Jay in general, is just like, boy, that strategic forethought of like setting a direction of where you want to go and then following through. And then years later, I just love hearing him on NPR and seeing like, okay, he broke, he did it. <laughs> he did it. Um, he did. But yeah, so let me, let's talk about that speed and some of that stuff. I want to wonder if you had an example of if you work with a brand and how you help them manage having that like a quick response on social media, like we know we need to have, but making sure it's also authentic and meaningful and brand appropriate and all these things. Because um, I found an old interview I did with Jay like 10 or 15 years ago, I don't know. And one of the things he said was, brands have to compete with customers, friends and family on social media and in email. And it's so true. I mean, when you hear it, it's obvious. I don't think a lot of brands think that way, though. They're not thinking, they're thinking of competing with other brands or not thinking of competing with, you know, friends and family, because they kind of forget that's the reason people first went on <laughs> Facebook or any of these social medias was to connect with their friends and family. And so what that says to me is like, well, yes, we have to be quick and accurate as brands would, but a way to differentiate from other brands is also feeling like it's human and authentic and meaningful, like you would from your friends and family. But from a management perspective, uh, from a branding and from a marketing perspective and having a broad team and responding 24 seven and doing all those things. Well, that's hard to staff for <laughs> and get the right rules in place and, and balance all that and be brand appropriate. And if you're a public company, like I said, you don't want to go viral for the wrong way. So that's a long question. There's a lot in that, but I think, I think that is what the challenge is, right? Yeah. So do, do you have any examples here of balancing that quickness yet being authentic and meaning and having real actual interactions on social media for a brand? Yeah, you know, I think actually one of my favorite, um, favorite organizations to work with is Visit California. Um, Visit California is an interesting one because they're attracting tourists to, I mean, fifth largest economy in the world is California. We don't think that way, but it's a massive place. Um, and they have tourists who are interested in coming and inquiring. And, you know, you kind of have two approaches to community management in a situation like that. You have the, you know, reactive, people are asking us questions. <laughs> you have the proactive of, Ooh, can we jump on that? Someone just said they're planning a vacation and why don't we throw our names in the hat? Um, and in a state that has wildfires, and, you know, dignitaries coming all the time and Disneyland and all these many, many, many things. There's just always something going on, coupled with the fact <laughs> that there's always people planning their trips and planning their events. And so a lot of activity um, 
And I think what I really, you know, love about this brand and the work that they do and why I, you know, aspire, I think they're a good use case, um, is that I think it's twofold. Thing number one is just having a good community management playbook. Like, how are we going to do this and scenario plan for ourselves? I think just knowing that it's not an if, it's a when is something that, you know, an organization like that has done really, really well. If you watch some of their, you know, some of their strategy at play, um, you know, it's not if the earthquake or when the, you know, or if the fire is going to happen, they're going to have, they're going to happen. So I think um, kind of planning how our take, our response, how we show that empathy, how we show that care, how we get information out quickly, you know, having good tools in place to, you know, really streamline and find efficiencies. Um, the other thing, if you, you know, look at some of their community management, they don't stop at just like, you know, oh, you're planning a trip. Here's an, you know, here's a link you could go to, they will have like five or six interactions with one person, um, you know, to really make sure that they've closed the gap that they've brought their vision to life. Um, and I, again, I think that's taking their audience and putting them, you know, really in the center and really showing a lot of care and concern. Um, and again, they have a lot of different people coming at, at them from all different markets, all different places. Um, so that's a brand I, I personally just really love to watch. I think that they've continue to, um, be a really dominant force in, you know, in how they're kind of building their strategy. Um, and you know, it's also just a great place to visit. So I also encourage anyone to head out to California and have a great trip there too. Yeah. Uh, you, I know the lesson you mentioned value productivity over perfection. You mentioned you learned this from Nicole Van Zanten, the co-president of ICUC, who's your current boss. Um, does that kind of value productivity over perfection, kind of tie in here as well, because if we are going to respond so quickly to so many people, in this case, from all over the world, where crises might happen, and you know, all of these things are going on. I mean, I don't think we could expect the level of perfection we would from our branding Super Bowl commercial, right? I mean, there's got to be some different level here where there's that productivity where we're actually serving these many people, even if it's not perfect, right? Or am I, or am I off base on that? No, I mean, I think you're, I think you're spot on. I at the end of the day, I mean, for, for starters, social media is just not perfect because humans are not perfect. And so we're yeah. humans and we're talking and we're sharing our life stories and it's perfectly imperfect. It might come with typos. It might come with your, you know, user generated content that is fuzzy and not pretty. And, but that's what we love. That's what we want. Um, and I think, you know, in a landscape where there's so much noise and so much talking, you know, we just got to show that we're there and we care and we're listening and, you know, again, maybe your response isn't absolutely perfect. And again, you have to be careful that you have a plan and you sort of scenarioed it out, um, you know, how this is going to go. But boy, you know, your fans and followers are certainly going to appreciate just that you showed up, even if it's a heart emoji, even if it's just love, you're listening, you're showing that you're kind of there and available. You build and grow off of your learnings and then you can get your strategies a little bit more tailor made. But um, you know, I just think it's, it's just so important to be active and show that, you know, do again, what we, what we can within our power. I think it's just easy. I sort of talked off the top of the show. I think how easy it is to get into our brands or get into our way of thinking or get into our agencies and just overthink to a point where you kind of miss the moment. Um, you know, not suggesting that you don't want things to go out that are well done and thoughtful. And, you know, we don't want to have sloppy pieces of work. I mean, we're marketers, we need to have a certain level of professionalism in what we're doing for sure. Um, but I think we also need to have a value in, you know, just, just getting out there and getting scrappy and trying new things and um, fail forward is something that, you know, I really believe in, you know, we're going to make mistakes, but did we learn from it? And did it move our momentum in the right direction? Um, you know, are questions you need to ask yourself. So you mentioned uh, Van Zanten partly inspired you to run your first marathon. So congratulations on that. Um, and uh, I always like to try to learn from other things going on in life, right? Because I don't think there's this work life or marketing different from other industries. It's just one thing. It's work life. It's all together. And I think we can learn from all these different disciplines. So I wonder, what did you learn from that marathon? that could apply to onboarding i'm serious i'm serious i see you laughing but you know can it apply to onboarding um a team and employees to manage our social media manage our brand because i would think like i've never gone nearly that far so congratulations to you just training for a 5k 
Uh, you know, we had this guy at work who was like this track star and he have us do these 5Ks and he trained. And it was, it was, it was, I liked how he did it. You know, it was like, okay, you do a little bit here, you push a little harder, then you go a little easy, then you push harder and you go here. And it would seem to me, and again, this is where you could say I'm off base, like training someone to be able to handle a brand's social media would, would be in a similar approach. It's like, okay, you know, we're going to start a little bit here, then we're going to push a bit, see how you take that. And you know, before we give you too much authority to really mess something up or you know, to see we get that trust and go back. And then by the end of that, boom, okay, now you're ready to run that marathon. It's race day and you go and we've got the Super Bowl or, you know, the wildfires or whatever's going on. So I just wonder, just having gone through that experience recently, are, are there any analogies there? Is there anything you learned from that or similarities you see to, to training someone for social media? It's so funny. I feel like my whole life and marathon identity was basically analogy to everything that I do now <laughs> in, in life. Um, you know, and for anyone who doesn't know me, many of you don't couch to marathoner in a year. I mean, I was like, wow, well, if, if you wow, saw me, okay. I, there's a knife yielding person behind me, you know, it running joke. I mean, I surprised my friends, my family, you know, and it started with just deciding to try a half marathon. And I thought I was going to walk it. You know, my goal was just to finish, but then, you know, you get halfway and anyone who's a runner is probably laughing, but you get halfway and you kind of feel like, well, maybe I should check that, you know, check that bucket list thing, you know, and oh my gosh. Um, but I really, the parallel I draw with training for a marathon, which was, well, I ran a thousand miles last year, Daniel, a thousand. Wow. Um, Congratulations. On average, I set my alarm, my my Garmin um, was hit before 5am, 50% of my runs. Um, so I it was a it was a dedication. Um, it was wild. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a little PTSD if you if you can't tell. Not <laughs> out of it. Um, but this the what I draw the parallel, it's strategy. At the end of the day, strategy. When you're training for a marathon, everything's strategy. You get so far and then something happens and you have to kind of change that strategy. And some days you absolutely complete what you're supposed to. And you know, other days it was just ugly and it didn't go the way we thought. And you're rooting yourself in a lot of data about your performance, about how far you've gone, about what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to eat, what's fueling you, what's inspiring the moment and, you know, all of the many, many things. And when you're working as a marketer, we're creating strategies and doing the same thing. <laughs> You're going to have setbacks and failures. When I was marathon training, I actually ended up getting a knee injury um, three months out from the race and one MRI and a cortisone shot later and a few physical therapy sessions and risk and fear. Um, you know, I was not sure I was going to see that, see that dream through, but the lesson for me whether you're building a brand strategy or whether you're running a marathon, believe it or not, is to, to kind of trust the process, know your goal, like set the goal at the beginning, because, you know, that has to be the thing you're sort of aiming for, you're reaching for, um, and, you know, follow the process, be comfortable kind of pivoting and making adjustments and optimizing, um, and there will be some days that are a little harder than others. And there'll be moments that you feel like maybe you're not going to see it through, but think you have to set the intention can be consistent and um and you'll really surprise yourself that that it can come to fruition i think it's it's very easy to give up at, at any point the easy button sometimes when you're when you have a strategy is to say ah oh, that's not working tear it all down and as marketers we can be kind of shoot from the hip sometimes if we haven't gotten enough leads you know, in a, in a set period of time and sales is getting, you know, anxious over that, it can be very quick to be like, well, cut the budget here, do this, do that, pivot that, eliminate this. And, um, I think at some point you have to just be very methodical about that and say, if we cut that and sacrifice that, that's one part of our funnel that goes away that may be serving a bigger purpose than you realize. So, it's just, let's just make sure that we're really thoughtful about why we had that campaign or why we had this sort of strategy in the first place. Have we seen it through as long as we should? And have we optimized it as much as we should? And again, you know, all roads lead back, no, maybe pun intended, um, but to, you know, to the marathon. But, you know, it's funny, we all joke about the kind of like, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And Boy, when you've actually run a marathon, you realize that that can be a very, it can take a long time. <laughs> so give yourself some grace and, and be patient, a theme, you know, that was asked in another question, be patient, 
Um, and you really can see your goals through and, you know, and now you learn if you want to do that again, I, you know, a little cross-eyed at the idea of ever wanting to do anything like that again to my being, but, um, you know, there are things you'd probably do a little bit differently the next time. So, uh, Oh, that was a big journey though. 26 miles and actually almost 28, because by the time it was all said and done and you're going around all the large winding roads. Um, I did my marathon at Disney world. Anyone who knows Disney world, large sweeping highways and long roads. Apparently my marathon was actually closer to 28 miles. And I, my watch told me that at the end, and that was very overwhelming because <laughs> I did not train for 28. <laughs> <laughs> train for 26 no that is impressive couch to marathon when you said when you told me originally i just thought like oh well maybe you've been like you know running track since high school oh, or something oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh definitely you know did a short stint of cross country for the wrong reasons for like, a boy or something and realized that was not for me and had have done a turkey trot or two in the last you know decade plus so this was a this was a really ambitious and very ambitious goal, but, um, I certainly, you know, hope to inspire anyone listening. If anyone ever has any questions about that process, I'm always happy to shoot me a LinkedIn. I'm always happy to share what that might or might not look like. <laughs> <laughs> not the ugly, very ugly some days. That's impressive. Um, well, one thing you'd mentioned when, when I asked you about that was the strategy and we don't want to just pivot because, you know, we don't have enough leads this quarter. And that is so true. <laughs> um, we feel but, that. Workers feel that in our, we feel that in our bones. Oh, yeah. But there, but there are reasons we sometimes do want to pivot. And one of those reasons is, boy, is this just a quickly changing industry and technology, right? As we talked about AI and TikTok and it's constantly going on. And what I like one of these lessons, you said, pay attention and look for trends. And you learn this from Matt Navarra of the Social Media Geek Out. And I think that's why it's so important to make sure you can you know, get ahead of those changes and trends versus, you know, wait a minute, you launched a campaign in the middle, <laughs> you know, something TikTok or something's totally different and the algorithm changed or whatever. Uh, so how did you learn this from that? Yeah. And for those of you who don't know who Matt is, he's sort of like the social media tipster and has been for a long time, has a really, really great e-newsletter. And, you know, I think what I appreciate about Matt is for starters, just his passion. You know, if you're, if you're passionate about what you do, you want to know what's going on. So you go and you fill out the Google alerts. You use all the tools and technology you possibly can to be constantly learning and growing. Um, I think, you know, from Matt, it's really about being that news breaker and, you know, knowing and kind of thinking through how that's going to impact your organization. Um, and I think, you know, knowing is half the battle. So you get the news and you see the trend. And then I think you have to really just sit down on it and figure out if that's right for us. Is it right for our consumers? Is it right for our goals? Um, and, you know, kind of check, check, make a matrix, check yourself, gut check yourself on when you want to, you know, say yes. And when maybe you want to kind of wait and see, um, especially in, I think the digital landscape, there's just new platforms all the time. There's new social media channels all the time. And, um, I think we can get a little bit, you know, two things can happen. You either get tired of it. You're like, Oh God, I can't, I can't launch on another platform today. <laughs> um, or you get overly excited and you're like, heck yeah, I want to do that. That sounds great. That's so fun. Um, either way, it's a lot of times, you know, there's time that you're investing, time you're spending. And um, I think, you know, you can do fabulous things like social listening or, you know, make sure to be doing sentiment tracking or, um, you know, again, other various tools and data that you can kind of pull together to sort of make sure you're pulsing your audience and, and checking if that's a right fit for you all. Um, when it's again, easy to follow the trends. Um, but you know, I think being methodical is, is always going to be really important. So doing marketing for ICUC, how do you decide when you go on a new platform or when you use a new feature, right? Cause marketing sure, but we're kind of in the same boat, you know, we I'll go out there to marketers. So I, I, do we have to be on every platform? Like I expect us to be here and there, but at the same time, as you know, like you said, it gets tiring. And are you going to support each and every platform? Um, but I've done many case studies of, you know, those early adopters at the gold rush where a uh, great uh, case study I did with a small jewelry company. I think they were called Brian Gavin Diamonds. And so they got into these conversations for jewelry that they wouldn't have if they weren't an old early adopter to Vine, right? They got on Vine early and boom, and then they got all this attention they wouldn't have otherwise. 
But at the same time, <laughs> we talk about Vine, it's past tense, right? So, uh, so for ICUC, you know, how do you balance that? A new platform comes out, a new, a new feature starts trending. How do you decide if you're going to invest in it, how you're going to invest in it, what approach you take? Um, you know, love that question. And I think, again, as all of us marketers, you know, can unite under this. As a marketer, I respect marketers. So I almost feel like I'm forever on demos. <laughs> but that's something I actually, I, I used to almost get like frustrated and tired. I'm like, oh, another cold outreach email. Oh, do I want to say yes to this? <laughs> or how do I safeguard my day and my time? But I try to make space for saying yes to some of the cold outreach emails that come to me because you learn so many things when you do that. Um, and again, I think it's easy to get kind of tired and weary, but if you really safeguard the space, know when you're going to do it in a given month, boy, you can learn a whole lot about what's out there in the landscape. Even some of the emails that you're like, this is, this is spammy or this is sketchy. This might be like black market. I'm not sure. <laughs> I've taken a few of those calls and you end, up being, <laughs> you end up being wowed. You're like, I'm sorry, who, who are you from? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but as a marketer, I'm busy doing the same thing. We're all just trying to find the best approach. And one of my absolute favorite outbound vendors that I work with was kind of one of those scrappy ones that sent me kind of a sketchy looking message, but I opened it, I clicked it and I laughed. I giggled at that message and I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to take a call with you all. They've been one of our we, best ROI success stories. Um, when it comes to, I think, evaluating some of the other platforms and channels, you know, that we would recommend clients to get on or even ourselves consider, you know, I think, um, like I said, social listening is something that I just deeply, deeply value. I kind of want to pulse check, you know, my industry, my service, my audience, and get a little bit of a sense of where everyone is. Um, as, you know, a marketing team, I think we kind of have to look internally across our resources. I love a test. I know pilot it was kind of a buzzword and not, you know, everyone's favorite. I think there's a lot of power in a test and giving some of these tools or techs or platforms just a little sliver of my budget. Again, when I take some of these, <laughs> some of these interesting calls um, and demos. But you know, what is the harm in safeguarding just a little bit of your budget to allow space to learn and grow? And even if it's not the next best thing, I assure you, you'll learn or you find the diamond in the rough, the little thing that you again, you know, early adopt on. And, you know, you end up kind of having this little secret that you have found something that's really kind of innovative and creative and, and moving your brand forward or hitting, helping you hit your goals. So, um, but you gotta, you gotta be curious. You gotta be willing. You gotta, I think, drink that extra cup of coffee and not let yourself get complacent and get tired. And it's hard. It, it is not always easy, but you know, back to the marathon analogy, you just, you just have to know where your passion lies. And, you know, and again, I think it's habit forming and making sure that you kind of keep in the habit. All right. Well, if you're a BDR listening right now or inside sales rep, I want you to hit pause. Yes, email look, me. Look up Erica Lovegreen and LinkedIn sales navigator, whatever, you know, emailing her. Because <laughs> she's going to go, oh. she's going to help you hit your numbers. This week. She's going to at least go for the demo. <laughs> I'll hear what you have to say, or I'll read your email and I'll learn something new. I love, you know, I, again, I think it's about respecting other marketers, you know, who are trying to do good work and being humbled and knowing we can keep learning from one another. And, um, so yeah, I, I do save those emails. I refer back to them. I've, you know, it might take me a while I'm in their funnel too. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's about respecting other marketers. It's respecting salespeople. We've had folks that we've reached out to. Um, and, you know, if you do cold outreach, sometimes folks are just mean, you know, they're, they're rude to BDRs. It's a hard job. Um, and I think my number one, fit, you know, fundamental belief is be kind, be nice, know that they're working hard too. And they believe in the value that they are providing. And, you know, there's a mission there too. And just be respectful, be kind. And again, maybe you'll learn something unexpected. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was interviewing a CMO of a major restaurant group. I think it's on the border Mexican restaurant. Maybe it was a different one. But uh, one thing she said in there was um, like, I personally go on two demos a week, like every week, yeah. regardless, I just pick two and I go on them. She's like, yes, most of them we don't use, <laughs> but she's like, yeah. but 
this is the way I find that next cutting edge thing. And, you know, some of them work, you know, and, yeah. uh, and I think that, that, that that's a great mentality. And I also thought too, boy, if you're BDR listening right now, what I would do is I'd pause it. <laughs> I'd look her up and boom, I'm going to hit my numbers that quarter. Um, I'll learn new from you, I promise. Yeah. Uh, so Erica, we talked about so much about what it means to be a marketer and apparently a marathoner and a broadcaster and all these things. But uh, if you had to break it down, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? Um, uh-huh. You know, I, I think curiosity is just that thing that always, always sticks with me. It's maybe the journalist in me. It's, you know, just not, it's just not settling. Like I'm, I'm never, I'm never settled. I think, you know, good marketers in my experience are just not, they're not settled because it's such an ever shifting, ever changing landscape. We're just, we constantly have to be learning. Um, And I think just having that, like that intrinsic, you know, as a trait, as a quality, curiosity is really, really important. Um, I, (laughs) I think that, um, you know, I, I, as a remote worker, um, feel very strongly in the power of, you know, being comfortable in yoga pants. <laughs> um, but I, I mean that, you know, jokingly, not jokingly, I think just being, you know, yourself, um, is something that I think is, is really important. Um, we all come with unique bringing that, you know, unique perspective that you as an individual person bring to the table and, not being afraid to kind of insert again, you heard my career history, it almost makes no sense. (laughs) Um, It's kind of quirky and, you know, all over the place. But in a room where we're being challenged by clients or challenging our own thinking, you know, when you bring yourself, even if it's the comfy version of yourself or the buttoned up version, whatever, whatever you are, um, you know, when you bring yourself to that conversation and your experiences, um, I think you can really, you know, help further what we're, you know, what we're trying to do and be a disruptor. Um, you know, the, I've always done it this way. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work in the marketing landscape. Um, so I think that is, you know, a a trait that is really, really important. Um, and then again, I mean, I'm a little biased to this one, but storytell, just human interest, storytell, pull it out. Um, don't, don't settle. You just can't settle. I think you have to keep, Um, you know, asking and questioning and reframing and, you know, just don't, just don't settle um, in anything that you're doing. I don't care if you're a paid marketer, an organic marketer, an SEO specialist or anything you're doing, you just can't settle. And there's a, there's a story there and a why of it. um, And really, you know, fundamentally understand that and pour that into anything that you're doing. Well, Erica, thank you for sharing your stories and so much of yourself today with our audience. Yeah, anytime. You know, again, I I just, like I said, respect marketers. Marketers love marketers. And if I can help, you know, any other marketer out there, that's certainly something that I pride myself on. We all learned from someone. We all had great lessons in life. And and I just think that we all want to do great work at the end of the day and we want to build incredible stories incredible businesses incredible campaigns and um always you know want to be that resource within our within our field to help one another i love that and uh, hopefully the marketers who are listening today were very helped so thank you all for listening thank you for joining us for how i made it in marketing with daniel burstein Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A dot com.